All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Daniel. I work at Facebook. I do various Linux-related things. I work on UMD and also uh, BPF Trace. Hi, I'm Anita. I'm a software engineer on the containers team. All right, so this talk is on UMD. Uh, oh, man. No, it's being slow. I think I skipped a slide. All right, cool. So here's a brief overview of this presentation. So we're going to cover motivations past development, uh, pretty much why we made UMD and uh, what the state of it was up until last year. Then we're going to cover present state. That covers up until now. Uh, then future plans, direction uh, we want to take MD, and then we have some time for questions. Uh, cool. All right, so motivations and past development. So I think it's important to back up and talk about resource control at Facebook. So uh, for those of you who weren't at the resource control at Facebook talk yesterday that uh, Dan gave, this is a brief overview. So it turns out, or so the main goal of resource control at Facebook is to isolate res uh, resources across applications. Uh, and it turns out this is a pretty active area of development, and it's kind of hard to do uh, to guarantee in a you know, sane manner. The main use cases we're targeting is uh, primarily protecting the workload. So imagine you have a server, you want to serve web traffic, the web, the web server is the workload. Uh, and typically you want to protect that, uh, protect that from anything that's not as important as serving web traffic. Because you know, if it's not serving web traffic, then like, why did you buy the machine? Another use case we've been looking into is side loading for batch workloads. So, for example, if you have, if you have extra compute capacity, maybe you opt opportunistically start transcoding video and then back off when there's not enough resources. Uh, we haven't done too much in that area yet, uh, not too much investment, but that's on the roadmap, I think. Uh, so, the way UMD fits into all this is UMD steps in when kernel resource isolation uh, isn't enough, and I'm going to talk more about that in uh, later slides. Okay, so what is UMD? So UMD is out of memory killing in user space. Uh, we claim it's faster and more accurate, and based on our deployments, we, we've seen that to be true in production. Under the hood, it uses C Group 2, PSI, and other various more traditional system stats. Uh, it's open source, it's under GPL2, there's a link to the GitHub. Uh, we recently also packaged it for Fedora, there's a link to the copper repo. Uh, hopefully, we, it's included in the main Fedora distro repository, whatever the terminology is, I'm not too familiar. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, we packaged it, and there's, there's the proof. Uh, so why UMD? So why did we create UMD? Uh, well, so there's a lot of reasons, and mainly because the kernel loom killer is somewhat in, uh, insufficient. Uh, so for example, the uh, kernel loom killer uh, configuration is not very intuitive. So there's a bunch of control files that's kind of archaic. Uh, there's all these knobs you turn with just like numbers. So some of these files go from like negative 16 to positive 15, and some of them go from like negative thousands, like positive thousand, and like, what, what do these numbers mean, right? They're, they're totally arbitrary. And this gets especially confusing when you have multiple teams working on uh, a shared system. So if someone sets, you know, some number to 100, and another person sets another number to like 200, well, if you weren't there for the decision making, the, the numbers don't really tell you too much. Uh, like, is one of them 100 times more important than the other? Is just a, a one, one time more important than the other? Like, I don't know, it's hard to say. Uh, the kernel loom killer is also somewhat slow to act. You know, it kicks in. By the time it kicks in, the user space is already kind of uh, screwed up. Uh, the reason for that is that the kernel loom killer is there to protect the kernel health. So if it thinks the kernel is making forward progress, then it won't do anything. Uh, a typical example is uh, the kernel is sitting there training pages, like constantly refaulting pages. Technically, that's forward progress, but to user space, user space may not be doing anything. So it could be spending 80% of its time just, you know, waiting for pages. So it's, it's, it's. Uh, you know, the workload's already kind of messed up at that point. Uh, the kernel loom killer also doesn't have uh, too much context on logical composition of system, right? Because to the kernel, everything's an application or just some program. Uh, so for example, like, there's stuff that you can imagine should always be killed together, right? So if one thing depends on the other, if you kill, you know, the base dependency, then there's no reason to not kill the other one because it's not doing anything. Uh, maybe there's other situations where there's, like, two redundant services, so maybe you shouldn't uh, ever kill both of them at the same time. Those are pretty hand wavy, but I'm sure you can come up with uh, you know actual scenarios. There's, it's also pretty hard to customize kill actions. So there's the VenFD, but that suffers the same problems that as as I mentioned in the last uh, the last slide. Uh, so for some processes, you know, typical SIG terms, it kills totally okay. Others might want some kind of you know song and dance. 
Uh, so for example, one, uh, one thing I used to work on, we implemented a hot restart. So instead of dropping client connections, you save the state machines and then you pass the file descriptors to another process and you reset up, uh, you reset up the world. Uh, so in cases like we can predict an oom coming, you, that would be optimal to restart it if you like, knew there was a memory leak. Uh, and for some uh, people at Facebook, they actually, that's actually what they can conf uh, configure OOMD to do. They restart a, sy a specific system to service uh, when a certain condition is met. Uh, so yeah, if you if you can like re do a hot restart instead of doing dropping connections, that's obviously preferable, and it's it's kind of hard to set up with uh, without MD. So the kernel killer is also somewhat non-deterministic. I mean, I'm, I, there's probably a way to get it more deterministic, and I'm really curious to hear about it if anyone's figured it out. But in general, at Facebook, uh, people have sort of given up on that uh, and just turn on panic on OOM. because if you don't know what the kernel killer is going to kill, it, it could kill something totally random, and now your system is in a non-deterministic state, and it's better just restart it because you can fail over to some other machine somewhere. So that's super suboptimal, so that's what we're trying to prevent, make it more deterministic. So that covers up until uh, about last year. So this is the recent development. So we, so OOMD2 happened, so essentially we turned OOMD into a rule engine, you know, it's just a bunch of if this, 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 and do that, if that, that, whatever, do whatever. Uh, the first thing we tried, so there's a bunch of things we unsuccessfully tried. The first was monolithic config. So the idea was you don't want people writing configurations if you can avoid it. So we were hoping that you could be smart enough to figure out, you know, what to do in a, any given situation. Turns out that didn't work. It wasn't flexible enough. You, you have to have some sort of configuration to tell the, tell them to like what you want it to do and what's in uh, situations. So then we pivoted to a plugin only. That was very short lived. We tried to get everyone to write their own uh, plugins. So we give them a hook. Please write some code to handle the OOM situation. Uh, turns out no one wants to do that. Like writing code is really annoying, uh, and no one wants to understand yet another framework. So we went somewhere in the middle. We did core plugins. So core plugins is we ship a set of plugins that we wrote that are pretty small. They do like one thing. It's pretty orthogonal, and there's like a self-consistent uh, interface. So if you understand how to use one plugin, the rest of them are pretty similar. And that worked actually really well. We're still using that today. Uh, super flexible, we can do all sorts of things. And if you need more functionality, you just add another plugin that does like one thing. So what that sort of enables is what I sometimes call a gotcha-free configurations. So the idea is you can make mistakes, but they should be pretty obviously your mistakes. So you shouldn't be burned by things you don't know you didn't know. Uh, so this is nice because you can like inherently uh, encode domain knowledge. So if, there's one example, the swap-free plugin. So we ship one plugin called swap-free. Essentially what it does is it tells you how much swap is left on a system. Uh, but there's this weird case, so if you have swap turned on and you have some pages in swap, and then you turn off swap, the system has to bring those pages back into main memory. And depending on how fast your system is, this could take some amount of time. Uh, but during that period of time, proc meminfo and proc swaps show slightly different information. Uh, so proc meminfo is somewhat misleading because it shows total swap as zero, which is technically true. But that can get you into weird spots when you know, swap is draining. So there is swap, but it says a total is zero, so you can get into like, you know, the math gets weird. So meminfo isn't wrong, but it gives you a somewhat incomplete picture because it doesn't tell you there's actually swap there, whereas proc swaps does. But then parsing proc swaps is also kind of a mess because there's like a bunch of like tabs, like tabs and spaces mixed in the format, so it's just really annoying to parse. Uh, so this is one of the things that you can encode the domain knowledge in, right? So, okay, so now we're gonna look at proc swaps, we're gonna parse it correctly, and then no one else needs to worry about it. They just use the plugin like they've always used it. So here's an example of a rule set config. It's kind of pointless to try and squint at that, so I simplified in some pseudocode. Uh, note that this isn't a full config, this is just a short, just one rule set of the arbitrary many that you can have. And so what this does is if a user slice, workload slice, or www slice slows by over 60%, or system slice slows by over 80%, then please kill the largest memory hog in the system. And then this is sort of um, you know, contrived, but uh, you, you, can, you can do very specific things in like one rule set and then just combine them orthogonally to do something uh, to, com uh, to cover a complex series of cases on your system. Uh, one other thing that we added was drop in configurations. So if you're familiar with the systemd drop in configurations, it's uh, which I assume most of you are, it's pretty much the same thing. It allows you to modify base configuration settings without having to modify the base config file. And this is useful in cases where uh, containers can move in and out of systems. So if you have a shared compute infrastructure and then a container comes in and has specialized config because it does some interesting stuff with a C group setup, like with whatever they delegated, uh, you drop this configuration in, it applies to the machine, or rather just their, uh, just their uh, container, and then when it leaves, it cleans up everything. And this is really nice. Uh, 
So one thing we considered doing, but we didn't do, was in ContainerMD. So the idea was instead of writing all this code to support drop-in configurations, why not just run an UMD instance in every container and then also have one running on the root host to protect the root host? Well, there's a couple problems with that. So the first problem was that um, perhaps a Facebook thing, but the monitoring inside a container is slightly different than the monitoring on the root host. And so we'd have to monitor two sets of monitoring configs that did the same thing, but like, you know, differently. The second problem is that uh, coordinating rollouts is actually pretty tricky. Because if you update the software on the root host, you don't necessarily, or you shouldn't necessarily update the software on the, in the container as well, right? So what if there's a bug fix that you fix in the root host but not in the container, and then debugging can get super weird? The third reason is that uh, it could be like a split brain issue. So the root uh, host UMD instance could race with the in container UMD instance to make a kill, and that could get super weird. And it's also kind of hard to get information flowing out of the container, because that's really not how containers work. So we learned a couple lessons from deploying this on um, somewhat wide scale. Uh, so the first is that most people, including myself, are pretty hazy on memory management internals. Uh, and so it's important that someone does it right and the work can be reused because uh, it's kind of pointless to get everyone really familiar with the space because it, I mean, for most people, they just want their code to, uh, to run, right? They don't really want to care about the details too much. The second thing is zooming is not a widely solved problem. So if you're dealing with infrastructure at a pretty large scale, uh, zooming happens all the time because, you know, various errors and bugs and whatever and new, new interesting workloads. Uh, the third thing is a lot of things can trigger Noom, and they're sometimes usually pretty unexpected. So one interesting thing we ran into is, uh, so for like networking code, if it can't allocate atomic memory, then it ooms the system, and it's like, well, I didn't know that could happen, but it did. And so understandable diagnostics are pretty crucial because, you know, most people, like, you know, the kernel dumps like the meminfo dump into D message, uh, or into K message, I guess, uh, when the system, the kernel um killer makes a kill. But like, if you know what you're looking at, that's super useful. But if you don't, it's, it's pretty much useless because you have no idea what it's saying. Uh, so future improvements. So there's a couple improvements that I've been thinking about. So, one, so a while ago, someone added uh, ePulse support to pressure files. So this is interesting because then you might be able to short circuit some logic and save on uh, CPU cycles instead of polling. Because uh, uh, some people complain about high CPU usage with UMD. And so we profiled and it turned out that most of the cost is coming from accessing memory.stat which used to be an O of N operation on the number of C groups in the system, plus a number of dead C groups that have not yet been reclaimed, which could grow pretty large in systems. And so sometimes that was really expensive to uh, you know, access memory.stat. But in newer kernels, this is an O of uh, one operation, because uh, they do passive accounting, so it's like per CPU accounting, and then you smush them all together when you access it. Uh, one interesting development is io.cost. So UMD right now actually monitors for IO issues across uh, C groups or across slices, uh, and that's kind of complicated. Uh, but io.cost could fix the issue, so that might be interesting, seeing how it simplifies UMD configs. So I'm going to close the talk with a proposal for where we see the future of UMD. If you've ever taken a look at how UMD is set up on the host, you'll notice that it has a pretty tight coupling with systemd. We expect you to turn on resource accounting with systemd, and the umd plugins actually need to understand slices in order to work. So why don't we bring umd to systemd? So as Daniel mentioned before, uh, kernel um killing is complicated, it's slow to act, and it's pretty inflexible in terms of what you can actually configure. However, we've shown that user space um killing with umd is both performant and flexible. And so we believe that because of this, user space is the right place for um killing because it provides the best insight into service level resource shortages. Um, um issues plague any sizable fleet. And because we want to make a solution like umd as accessible as possible, uh, we want to make it Oh yeah, we want to make UMD as accessible as possible. Systemd is well positioned between the kernel and the application to make well-informed UM killing decisions. And thus, if UMD were to be shipped with Systemd, it would be well positioned to provide sane defaults for all the hosts running Systemd. And if UMD were to be shipped with Systemd, it'd provide a cohesive configuration experience using the syntax that you're already familiar with to configure units. So what are we actually proposing? Well, you'd need the systemd umd binary, of course, um, but we'd also ship a core set of plugins. This would be following the umd2 model versus the monolithic configuration model of umd1. 
We'd, of course, provide a way to configure UMD through unit files as well as through DBus and a tool to view the host-wide UMD configuration so you don't need to shuffle around different files to figure out what UMD is doing. Here's a mock-up that Daniel and I came up with for how we might potentially configure UMD on a host. So here we have system.slice, and in addition to the usual slice section, we would have an UMD section. Under the UMD section, there's an UMD detector property, which is split up into three subsections separated by a colon. The first subsection is the name of the condition. In this case, we name them system large and system tiny. The second subsection is the name of a plugin. And then the last subsection would be the argument to the plugin. So in this case, we have two detectors. What system large is saying is if the total memory usage for 10 seconds is greater than 5 gigs for longer than 5 seconds, um, then system large will fire. And system tiny would be the same thing, but for 1 gig. To configure the UMD actions, we'd propose to have a configuration with an UMD condition property and an UMD action property. Action would be split up into two subsections like the detectors were. The first subsection would be the plugin name, and then the second would be the argument to the plugin. So in this case, our example is showing that if a system large fires, then we'll try to kill the biggest memory hog in system slice. And if that fails, we'll try to kill the next biggest thing in user slice. Of course, this is all just in the discussion phases. So if you're interested in talking to us about this, we'll be at the conference and the Hackfest tomorrow. OK, that's all we had. So we're going to open the floor for questions now. Any questions? So you mentioned the IO cost as a possible improvement. How would uh, the UM to take uh, like the IO cost into advantage? Uh, so the, right now the UMD configs we have are pretty complicated because they have to take into account IO. <clears throat> they, they, they like watch IO between different slices and C groups. Uh, that's because the kernel is like th there wasn't a mechanism to enforce that in the kernel that was like that actually worked really well. Uh, and so if you, the kernel added that, which it tried to do, or is trying to do an IO cost, then maybe you can simplify the UMD configs a lot and get it like much shorter. Because right now they're, they're pretty long with a bunch of rules, uh, rule sets. So that, that'd be the main improvement. Hi. Um, in system D243, I think there is now a, for unit files or um, service files a new property that you can also configure UMD um, behavior a little bit. Um, do you know more about it or how this would um, integrate with um, your, your daemon, daemon? I believe the UM policy stuff is for the kernel UM killer. Um, this would be a user space UM killer. So you could actually like choose to kill specific services rather than just like yeah, whatever the kernel's gonna do. Um, but actually, I like that it's a very good question. I think because um, like most of the UM policy stuff uh, in systemd is actually bound to the fact that the kernel tells us that there was an UM event on a specific service, so that we can log about this and, and track this in the state of the service, so that the administrator can eventually learn about this because that's useful information. Have you thought about um, somehow, uh, like, uh, how precisely do you actually kill? You just call the kill system call, or do you do anything different than that? Like, because it would be interesting if you could even um, uh, if uh, you kill um, due to OOM from user space, somehow tell us that you did that for U OOM, right? Um, that would be, yeah, because then systemd could track it and like as if it was the kernel side, because from systemd's point of view, there shouldn't, it shouldn't matter if it's a kernel or user space or whoever did it. it. It just wants to know that that's the reason why it, that happened. Yeah, I'm not, I have to look at the mechanism more closely, but I think, so what we did in the past was we set the X adder attribute on C groups we killed, 
And then so when like the container agent um, detects that you know process has died, it'll check the X adder on the C group as well to see if Undi made the kill. Uh, obviously, that's like not like unified, right? That's not how the kernel tells you to do uh, it made an um kill. I think it does like the uh, event uh, memory dot events or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I think it'd be interesting to investigate, explore what the options are. How exactly do you kill a container? Do you execute a command to kill the container, or do you just start shooting the processes in a C group in the head? Uh, it's a while loop with SIG kills. Yeah. Yeah. It's not optimal, but yeah. I mean, I think we should probably freeze the C group and then start killing things, but we haven't run into issues with that yet. But you don't set um, PID1 of the container uh, SIG int to allow it to clean, attempt to clean up. It just, it's too late at that point. Um, I mean, so th there are different plugins that like send a SIG term first and then wait a bit to then the SIG, send a SIG kill, which is a pretty typical behavior. But right now it's just SIG kill. Yeah. Okay. If there's no more questions, then thank you for your presentation.